Welcome to Kidney Health Interview. I'm your host, Natalia Karpenko. Each week, I interview a guest who a kidney patient, their family member, organ donor, or healthcare professional. Our goal to empower every kidney patient with the support and education. Join our podcast. Hi everyone, today we are with uh, uh, Jeff Jones and we'll be speaking today about uh, how to build a strong uh, support system and proper mindset to managing chronic illness as well as uh, building a high quality of life and motivation. Uh, so hi Jeff, great to see you today. Great to see you Natalia and hello everybody. Um, like Natalia said, I've been on dialysis for over 35 years and I'm here to talk with her to share my story and hopefully you can gain some insight from my journey. Yes, uh, great to have you here. And you know, it's been wonderful having your support for the last four years, <laughs> right? Um, uh, Jeb was one, the first patient uh, uh, that inspired our team to work on Renal Made project. And it was really amazing how we met through Twitter. And, and it's amazing what the social media does these days. And some of you watching us on IHDTV, uh, some, uh, some of you will see our video on a podcast. But we certainly believe that new media is a great enabler and a great tool for connecting more people together. Uh, so that's why today we'll be sharing uh, some of the experiences uh, Jeff had in his long journey <laughs> on dialysis. Um, and uh, Jeff, tell me more. Yeah, like I stated that I've been on for over 35 years. Um, when I was first diagnosed with uh, that I was going to have kidney failure, I was in denial of it. I didn't really understand what I was going to happen. Uh, I was working at a computer company down in Silicon Valley, and I wasn't feeling very well. And so I went to the doctor, and they said, there's something really wrong. We need to refer you to a specialist, which was a nephrologist and they did the test and told me that my kidneys were failing that I was going to be a dialysis patient. had no idea what that was. They said that in about two weeks from the diagnosis I would have surgery on my arm for my uh, fistula, which is the access they use for dialysis. It had been about one week since that uh, appointment was scheduled and I was staying at a friend's house and I got up one night, took two steps and just face planted right on the floor. My oh, balance, my equilibrium was gone. Uh, something was definitely very wrong. So I called the doctor and explained what was happening and they said come to the uh, hospital immediately. They were going to put in an emergency shunt in my net to start dialysis. And the, the it's kind of funny, it's kind of like in a movie. How old were you at that time? Uh, I was 26. 26 years yeah. old and you just went to emergency? Uh, with yeah, they told me to, it was to go to emergency. I was staying with some friends of mine and they took me there. And uh, kind of like from the movies, the doctor that was supposed to do the surgery, his car broke down on the way and he walked up to someone and said, I'm a doctor, you have to take me to the hospital to a, to a driver. And so he drove to the hospital. Um, there was some huge emergency at the time and the emergency room was full. And so they had to uh, do the emergency surgery in a waiting room next to the uh, emergency room it's to incredible. put in the shunt so they could start doing dialysis. And that was my uh, dramatic beginning of the start of this journey. Um, I still didn't really understand what dialysis was because I was in denial of it. I was sitting in the, uh, the uh, hospital bed and the nurse was explaining to me, she said that I uh, never miss, and I go, what are you talking about? And I said, she goes, well, the needles. And I said, what needles? She says, well, we're going to be putting needles in your arm when you have your access. And I had no idea what it was, and then I went into total shock, because then the realization of my, de my, my denial of what my life was going to be like. I thought I'd be in the hospital, something would happen, I'd be back to my life again. No, it was the beginning of, of a whole new type of lifestyle that I was totally unprepared for. Wow, I mean that is incredible, just being 26 years old, being crushed on dialysis, into dialysis, yeah. and uh, uh, just have so little insights. I had no idea what was going to what was going to happen. About um, obviously in the beginning, it's it's important that you control your fluids, 
and I was terrible at it. I had no idea how to control it. I was drinking too much fluid. Like I think on one of my first dialysis runs, I had six kilos on. Oh, wow. Which is like, what, 14 pounds or something, which... That's a lot. That was a lot. Mm -hmm. And I cramped, and oh, the pain was just terrible. I couldn't handle it. And so, but one thing about pain, it's a good teacher. Wow. <laughs> so you want to um, experience less pain. So then, little by little, I started controlling my fluid and starting getting in with the program. Um, so since you've been 35 years on dialysis, you have so many realizations. And certainly, um, ESRD tend to be very painful disease physically and mentally. Yes. Uh, so there are different phases uh, in this disease. And um, some of the knowledge I'm sure you can share with us and some of our listeners. Uh, so starting with the fluid management. Mm -hmm. So that was something very new and nothing that you have to be managing previously in your life. Correct. Uh, so that was complicated understanding how you're supposed to be drinking less right. and how to overcome the urge of uh, feeling thirsty Correct. Um, and just wanting to reach out to that soda water or just you know glass of water in a s summer day. Uh, so what's your lessons learned from that one? How did you adjust and kind of manage your fluid gain between dialysis appointments? Um, what I started doing was the advice that they gave at the dialysis center was um, you, know, you can put like uh, ice cubes and suck on an ice cube so you're not drinking fluid all at once. They had a uh, where you could put grapes in the freezer and freeze them and be like little popsicles that you could <coughs> use. Um, it, it was hard for me though to learn how to judge how much water I would say if I fill a glass of water up compared to what a bottle of water is which is measured. So it took me a while to figure that out and then I decided just to start drinking all of my fluids out of a, out of a water bottle because then I would know the fluid count and then I would make um, marks on the bottles like this was this many kilos or this was this many milliliters and so I started slowly managing it that way. Um, right, so that was the starting point, right? Learning right. about uh, some of the ways how the uh, nurses or dietitians would recommend to do this in dialysis unit. Correct. And then being 35 years in the dialysis, you became certainly a master of managing <laughs> your fluids and you always have such a excellent vitals and fluid gain between dialysis appointments. So what do you do now to actually manage your fluid gain and how do you control? Because as to me, it seems you got your own system set up that really works and help you to do not cramp or cramp less, right. don't feel exhausted after dialysis. So what are your own um, techniques and in inventions <laughs> in that regard? Um, what I found works easy for me is I like, I like the lime seltzer water, which is 335 milliliters. And so I try to limit myself to no more than three cans or try to do two cans a day. So when I come into dialysis, I'm either, I'm usually below my dry weight and that allows me to bring fluid and drink fluid on dialysis. Now this is just my own system. You would want to check with a doctor to verify this, but I like to drink fluid on dialysis. I like to hydrate my body because when I come off dialysis, I don't feel as tired and as wiped out as you can uh, from a normal treatment. So your system is quite opposite. Let's say majority patients on dialysis tend to use the time between dialysis to drink as much as they can. Correct. Or actually, not as much as they can, unfortunately. Right. <laughs> as less as uh, uh, they can. And then on dialysis, they try to get rid of all the fluid. Right. On your side, you are very restrictive right. between dialysis sessions. Um, and your fluid usually, if you're saying you're uh, drinking uh, 355 ounce, uh, Gram, milligrams. Right. That's around like um, a 12 ounces, uh, 12 ounces mm -hmm. uh, per each can. Mm -hmm. So you're drinking 24 ounces per each day, and within two days, it's uh, 48 ounces, right. which is um, let's say maybe a liter and a half, or like actually a liter and 200 milligrams, so, right. uh, which is certainly allows you to drink another two cans while you're on dialysis. Right. So that's kind of like I reward myself uh -huh. because you. You definitely like to drink fluid when you're on dialysis. And so my, for myself, my self-discipline is 
I get to have a lot of fluid and drink it on dialysis and enjoy it with ice, and then I start the routine over again. And so that's just what I do because it makes it psychologically more um, palatable for me to do it this way for my time on dialysis. It's almost like dialysis becomes a reward instead of a, p a punishment because now I get to drink. Wow, yeah, I like that also. Psychological trick, Psychological right? Psychological trick, yes. Um, so with that said, you know, considering uh, summer coming up and it's uh, warmer mm -hmm. and we live in California right. and some of our patients also in the places where they have really warm weather. Right. What do you do when you feel thirsty? Like, you know, some days you just may feel thirsty because you took that walk. And yes. Like, it's... how would you be able to control that or how much water would you drink in this case? Um, that's, that's really tough because you're also sweating, perspiring, so you're mm -hmm. losing fluid at the same time. So, um, what I'll do is I'll usually have some type of um, candy or something that will wet the mouth, like a mint, mm -hmm. to keep that so your mouth is uh, not drying out as much. Um, gum, chewing things that um, <coughs> that will keep saliva um, in your mouth. That didn't sound good. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. It's all those tricks of uh, you know of your own uh, practice. Uh, so that is something just keeps you. Um, uh, mouse moisture, yes. right? So you don't feel that incredible dryness that, that doesn't allow you uh, to speak, right? To breathe. Well, well, and also too, I breathe a lot through my nose. Mm -hmm. That I learned to do that and in and out through my nose more than I do my mouth, especially on the hot days, because then you, your mouth dries out so much faster. Mm -hmm. So if you can uh, adjust to doing nose breathing, that can help too. Um, yeah, that um, sounds very precise. <laughs> uh, every every ounce counts yes. when it comes to fluid gain and, and in a hot season. And um, uh, with that said, uh, specifically nutrition also impacts the way how we consume fluid. Right. Eating fruits, uh, soups, drinking coffee, beverages, right. uh, it's all fluid. Right. And it's pure way. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? How do you manage, you know, fluid gain with actually, let's say, eating an apple? Um, well, yeah, you can eat the apple. Um, you, you really want to double check, though, and talk with your uh, dietitian because you may have certain uh, restrictions that you need to follow and, and uh, adhere to. But in, in general, you have to be careful of fruit like or like watermelon because it has a lot of fluid in it. Um, fruits that have a lot of fluid in it I avoid during the summer because you don't realize sometimes how much extra fluid you're taking on without realizing it. You just have to be really careful um, monitoring your fluid. It's something that you have to be thinking about all the time. And I know it's hard because I, when I try to explain to people, it's, it's a natural process. Your body is saying you need fluid and you can't drink, it's almost like I tell people if you were to try to take a, a breath every other breath, like your body's telling you to breathe and you say, no, I can only breathe every other breath. That's kind of like what your body is going through when you're feeling its natural um, biology to drink fluid. So it's kind of a mind game that you have to play with yourself to realize that you need to um, control your fluid watch the fruits that you drink, eat during the summer, and uh, just be mindfulness of what's going on. Just pay attention to what you're doing, and you'll, you'll do fine, you'll do okay. It takes a while to get on, used to it, but um, with, with practice, you'll, uh, you'll find your way. That's a great advice. Um, and with your personal experience, do you have like a measuring cup you use for this? Let's say, do you have like different cups that you use, let's say, manage your you know, put your watermelon in it or put something in it to just really assess the size of it Yeah, I, uh, in I, a perspective of fluid gain? Yeah, I just use a, it's, I, I use a little cup. It's probably about... A little? Yeah, a little, little cup. Just <laughs> a little, little, little okay. cup. It's probably... It's a real small cup. Yeah, I use, because I don't want to overdo it, so it's probably <laughs> about... Oh, uh, it's probably actually about two cups. It's just really small, because uh -huh. I put little small pieces in there because I, I discovered if I had a bigger bowl, then I'm going to eat more. 
So, as some of us do. Yes. So, Whether it be kidney patients right, or exactly. just not. If it's there, oh, there's there. There's, you just go in and you do it. So I have a little bowl and I cut up a little bit of it, like say a, a pineapple at a time. And I'll put the little pineapple in there. But then I won't um, go back and get more until I've eaten that up and uh, keep it in the small container. So, so that way you just don't overdo it. <laughs> right, and it's a good, uh, probably, way to also educate yourself, right? To yes. teach your vision, to teach your eye, right. to assess how many pieces of pineapple actually right. within half a cup. Right. And the serving size, it's always, all of the SRD patients hear that every time when they speak to their dietitianist. Service, serving size yes. is the key yes. to really managing kidney diet. And at the beginning, it has to have, you have to have time to learn that serving size. Yeah. And another time, after a year or two, when you understand the precision, right. you can become expert like Jeff. <laughs> and just with an eye, you can measure whether it's three, four ounces, a cup or two cups. Yeah, it becomes intuitive. Like, even if I don't, like normally what I'll do for my seltzer water, I'll label the cans. Like, because if I could have, a couple cans out there, I go, what did I drink those yesterday? Did I drink those today? So I'll put like one, two, or three, uh -huh. I'll mark on the can. But I've gotten to a point right now where um, I just intuitively know how much fluid I've, I've drunk on a day. I can feel it in my body. And so it, it becomes second nature, but it takes a while to get used to all that. I, I usually tell uh, new patients, you have to be really patient. There's so much going on. You're learning about diet, you're learning about everything that's going on. There's this machine, you're learning about blood pressures, you're learning about what to look for if your blood pressure lows. It's, it's very overwhelming. And I would say give it about a year. It takes about maybe six months to kind of understand the diet and the routine, and then about another six months to acclimate to it. And it takes about took me about a year to psychologically adjust to it. Within the six months, all my physical stuff I had adjusted to, but getting in the mindset of what your new lifestyle is, it took me about a year. And that's what I uh, advise patients, to just take it slow and just go with the guideline and you'll find your way. Um. Right, it's a long journey, right? It's, it's and, a long uh, journey. It's not a sprint. And we'll continue now our conversation about uh, life on dialysis. And Jeff, one of the longest living dialysis patients, he's been on dialysis for 35 years, and he's doing pretty well. <laughs> uh, so today we'll be speaking about how to gain your life back while you're on dialysis. It's been a long journey. You will have a lot of ups and downs. It's the the best. It's the best way to deal with dialysis is to if you can find a positive mindset, then the physical aspects of what you have to go through become manageable. I realized on early on dialysis when I was in the hospital. I said, I have a choice. I can let this defeat me, or I can champion it to do the best I could. And so I chose, well, let's just try championing it. I didn't know what it would that meant. I didn't know how, how to do that, but I just set out that I would try to find ways to get my life back as much as possible and not have to deal with the negativity that I realized would probably come with going through such a chronic disease. Right, so it's certainly the personal decision yes. uh, that uh, each person have to make Correct. which way to go. And uh, being diagnosed with kidney disease, especially with such a severe condition as a, uh, ESRD and stage renal disease, when it's out of the control of the person, they have to be admitted to dialysis if that transplant Correct. is not yet available for them. That brings a lot of anger, a yes. lot of inconvenience, yes. and really hard phase in life. Adjustments, why me, right? There are a lot of yes. questions. Yes, and there's a lot. How, what was your first phase, right? This phase of like realization and shock and some level of anger. And Correct. how did you 
tell me more about this, yeah. and then we'll talk how would it help you to transform that anger into something more positive? Well, it, at first it was main, mostly just denial that I thought, well, I'll get through this, and then I'll get back to my life. And then after about six months of being in that denial, I realized this is my new life. Mm -hmm. That the limitations I was going to have to understand, the physical limitations, were a new part of this life. Um, the, the, what I started doing was starting to learn as much about the process, the technology, the machine, to empower myself to not just be someone that came in and everybody did their job. I wanted to underst have a understanding of what the different jobs were in the unit and what was having place so I could be start becoming more empowered and not feeling as helpless to know how to work with the team instead of having the term just serve, serve my needs and not really participating in the process. That's how I started out to realize, um, to get my mindset in almost like a meditative state before I come into dialysis, kind of like, okay, relax, breathe, center myself. This is what's gonna take place today in my mental, give my mental picture of what's going to take place, the whole procedure, and then I would go into it and instead of just coming in and being unprepared. I would mentally prepare myself for each session. That's, that sounds beautiful practice, and I'm sure it's very valuable for many out there who might be looking for the right approach mm -hmm. to feel better. Yes. Um, well, I really like what you said about the team and connecting more with the dialysis unit team. Yes. Just imagining that there are people in a unit that we interact every other day right. across years of our life. Yes. Um, being dialysis patient as you are, it's the best to build a good relations with them. Yes. Yes. Right? Because in some ways they become your best friends. Your second family. Or basically. second family. Exactly. And that is so cool that you said the big transition for you was really looking at the surrounding right. and building more presence and saying, who is here involved in my care yes. and depending on their way of treating me and how I treat them, yes. they're going to set up better relations, yes. better environment. Like get to know the names of all the techs in your unit so you can address them by the name because then you feel you have a more personal connection with what's going on. Also too, when you're on dialysis in the beginning, you're kind of not sure what to do. And if you're ever feeling um, like, like your blood pressure is getting low, or you're not feeling good, or your muscles are twitching, you need to you notify them immediately, it's not going to go away. And this is a difficult thing I had in the beginning because you don't want to um, feel like you're causing them problems is what I felt personally that mm -hmm. I didn't want to bother them, they were doing their job. But you have to be very self-aware what's going on with yourself. If you feel something different, even the slightest thing, go ahead and notify the text. They're there to serve you, they're there to help you, and they'll respond to make sure everything's okay. Yeah, so that's an important aspect, right? Yeah. On one side, at the beginning, learn about the team and dialysis unit. Right. But still, you need to remain that understanding if they become your peers and friends, right. still there to empower you right. to be healthier. Right. And that's why you have to be responding and talking to them right. also on a level of they providing care to you. Um, so going back to the aspects of uh, you know, getting life back right. while you're on dialysis. So that was a journey for you. Right. Uh, starting with um, aspects of denial, shock, some anger, but then transforming your energy uh, from frustration into positive and being more curious. Right. Building those relations that available, but then also setting up your own mindset. Correct. There is time on dialysis and there is time outside. Right. And for many patients, they treat dialysis as something we do as work time, as Correct. Um, difficult time, as frustrating time, almost want to close their eyes while they're on dialysis right. and leave as fast as they can to be able to have their life. Right. Also, what was your experience with uh, you know, measuring the time on dialysis versus life outside of dialysis? Well, there's, there's different types of dialysis. 
I do the hemodialysis, which is the needle insertions in the arm. Um, and I, I chose that because you come into the unit, you dialyze for three hours, and then you leave. And that way I got a separate, like I have my life, and then there's the dialysis, almost kind of like a, a part-time job. And then on the days away from dialysis, I could get to a point where I would not so much think about it. And so for me, it was better for my mindset um, to choose that type of dialysis to um, feel more free and more independent of um, not living on dialysis 24 hours a day. Right, so treating it more like a part-time job? Yeah, I looked at it as a part-time job instead of like I'm going to dialysis. Um, and that's actually a cool mindset, right? When you're looking for the job, uh, we know that job provides us opportunity, right. uh, whether it's material, uh, whether it's emotional, whether it's a skill set uh, fulfillment. Right. Uh, so on one way, treating it as a job helps to bring better discipline right. in terms of time management, the way how you manage relations on dialysis. Mm -hmm. And when you're done, you feel relieved, you will feel complete. Right. Right. And you know you accomplish. Yeah. Uh, something through your half-time job. Right, as it's, it's keeping you alive. It's your half-time job to keep you alive. I have a, uh, a funny story about looking at it as a job. About 20 years ago, I was taking a um, film class at College of Marin, and this girl was doing her film shoot out in China Camp, out in Marin County. It was an elaborate film shoot, like a turn-of-the-century uh, shoot. She had horses and carriage, and very elaborate. And I, was, beautiful. and I was doing the sound recording for her, and it was on a Saturday, and I, was, I had to dialyze Saturday afternoon. And we were about in the football field area, and she was on one side, and at that time my uh, friend was in the middle of the field, and I was at the end, and I was getting ready to leave, and I had found somebody else to replace to do the sound recording. And she didn't know that, she saw I was leaving, and she yells across the, the uh, field, where's Jeff going? And my friend in the middle is yells, he's going to dialysis. And she said, he's going to do Alice? Oh. Who is Alice? Who is this woman? I, and she's making this big fit. He goes, no, no, no. He's going to dialysis. Oh, my God. So ever, oh my so, God. So, so ever since then, everybody says, well, Jeff, how's Alice today? So right. That's you... a way, way to treat dialysis. That's my second, right? So, so that was... Kind of a, yeah. a funny story that happened on <laughs> dialysis when compared to kind of comparing it to a job that that's a kind of job, right? <laughs> is it a creative job? Is it a romantic job? Is it boring job? Is it annoying job? Right? There are so many adjectives you can put next to the job, and it's more positive. Those adjectives could be maybe there is more appreciation, um, and you know, truly, right? For many patients, they are. Uh, sometimes get struggle because dialysis is also limiting. It is tired yes, and yes. Uh, limited to, you know, saying no to so many friends and family members to be involved in, right. you know, busy life of others who do not go on dialysis, and that kind of creates a uh, term, a groundhog effect. Groundhog Day. day? Yeah. So yeah, tell me more that. about your. As, as you're term. all probably familiar with the movie with Bill Murray called Groundhog Day. Uh, he lives the same day over and over and over again, and then he gets finally to the point where he just doesn't care about anything anymore, that it's just as, it's meaningless. Well, I see that effect on dialysis patients. They get caught up in what I call the Groundhog Day Syndrome, where you just don't care anymore. And um, it, you want to avoid getting to that point. Um, I was remembering when I was first on dialysis, uh, I was so sick, I was so weak, I could, I could only walk maybe 20 feet and I was exhausted because I um, had, was so um, ill at the time. But what I started doing one day, so I would get up and maybe the first day I would walk 20 feet and then maybe the next day I'd walk 25 feet and then maybe I could walk to the curb and then maybe a couple of days later I could walk down to the, the post office box. So I did something that would change the routine every day so it wasn't repeating the same thing over and over again. You can get, can get caught into that groundhog syndrome. Right, so in one way to 
uh, you know, understanding, right, where you at, and then admitting what's really not working well, Correct. and uh, uh, feeling uh, frustrated, feeling that the days are really dependent from the dialysis sessions. Correct. Sometimes drive patients into that mindset that uh, there is only negative things in my life, right. Right. and it's really hard to find some other motivation and some right. other goals. So that's why it's very important to find a co coping mechanism yes. that would help to uh, diversify experiences right. and start learning some other things about your life to really get your life back. There are ways to practice it. Right. And in one way, when it's a very early stage and persons might be limited in their mm -hmm. physical and mental place mm -hmm. yet, it's small steps. Exactly but measuring progress, right? right? Just trying to push more every day, but also setting up goals. What were some of the goals you set up very earlier, or where you can kind of wanted to fight, right. but you needed to find the mechanism and set up those initial goals to get you started? What it was is I would find anything to do, just do something different on the day off, instead of like getting into the routine of doing the same thing. If it would be go to a shopping mall that I had never been before, or go to the movie theater, or go to a library, or just drive to a place that I didn't, hadn't been before. I just needed to do anything I could think of just to do something different to break the routine, like maybe start reading a book that I hadn't read before, or go to the community college and see if I can enroll in a class. Just um, whatever you can think of even if it's not something you're really interested in, just get out and go do something different. I would just um, take that day and say, okay, this is this day, I'm off dialysis, I don't want to sit home and watch TV all day, let's go do something. And maybe I wouldn't know what it was I was going to do, but I would just get out and find something. Yeah, that's really great. It sounds like opportunity to explore and learn and stay curious. Maybe someone like more creative side of things, uh, drawing, painting, writing poems, yeah. maybe, uh, you know, volunteering. Um, it could be also, you know, spending time with family and friends. Yeah. Um, it could be uh, learning a new language, enrolling into the class, taking that day trip. Right. And it's something that someone can just brainstorm. Yeah. Go on the whiteboard, go on a sheet of paper and just write everything that inspires you and maybe put in an order of things that what you can do this month, next month or yeah. next year. Yeah, just go out and, and, and almost to use another uh, <laughs> Bill Murray movie was What About Bob and he was working with a psychologist and his whole theory was baby steps. Mm -hmm. And you get, take the baby steps and you start progressing and go farther. So you just start with the baby steps on dialysis and you create a, an environment where you're not going to be depressed. It's all up to you. Right, that's, that's excellent. And um, as you know, we're working on a life enhancement program mm -hmm. uh, for dialysis patients and open, uh, hopefully open it to other patients in pre-diagnosis uh, pre mm -hmm. with uh, end-stage renal disease. And the big part of our program is uh, empowerment aspects that involve in our daily happiness, self-management, and disease management. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is uh, truly awareness, presence, and mindfulness. Yes. How to set up the mindset yes. that allows you every day to change the, um, you know, have a driving seat and right. change the control of your thoughts. Right. And staying positive certainly brings so much stronger energy in the right direction. Exactly. And uh, honestly, Jeff, you are one of the most inspiring people to me. <laughs> Uh, with your personality and uh, your attitude toward your life, toward other people, yeah. and being chronically ill patient, it's just one other thing. But besides this, you're very uh, complete and very exciting person to be around. Yeah. Uh, so tell me more, how do you manage your mindfulness, your daily practice that allows you to enjoy life and something that maybe other patients would like to use or practice? Um, well, yeah, mindfulness is the... Um it's very popular these days. I actually found there was a class at the local uh, hospital that they give a free mindfulness class once a week, and I go to that once a week, which is wonderful. Um, so check, you know, with your local hospital. They may have programs. They also have a free uh, Qi Kung program. If you don't know what that is, it's like a Tai Chi program, and it relaxes the body and mind, and that's also a free program. They have 
several that are low cost, so you can check with your local hospital if you have a, uh, a recreation center that's in your uh, city, you can uh, look at them, they may have classes on stuff. As for myself, what I uh, discovered early on was a mindfulness practice called uh, Reiki, which was uh, developed in Japan many, many, many years ago. And I found for my own personal well-being that um, the Reiki is what works for me. Wow, that's great. How often do you practice, practice Reiki? I would actually have been doing it on myself as we've been talking here. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, I just do it all the time. It's just become a second nature to me. I just, just use it as uh, kind of like just a, you kind of like a walking meditation, they call uh -huh. it. Like I'm always constantly doing it on myself all the time. We're talking about uncensored content <laughs> uh, by some of the ESRD patients and some of the most unique experiences they have. Um, since Jeff, one of the longest living dialysis patients, he has quite a list of the stories. Well, and maybe they're a little uncensored. So, so he promised something really fun <laughs> to share well, with us. Well, this is, this is a crazy experience I had on dialysis. I was dialyzing in the Petaluma, California unit which is close to the uh, San Quentin prison. And they had all the prison inmates that were on the dialysis uh, run that, that, that I was on. I was the only free person on the unit. Wow. And they had two, secu two uh, security guards, sheriffs, with the inmates and the handcuffs, and they'd take them in and out of their handcuffs, and they'd dialyze. Well, I was sitting across from the bathroom, and a security guard or the sheriff or whatever went in there and came back out and then an inmate went in there. Well, when the sheriff went into the bathroom, he forgot to bring out his gun. Okay. And so I'm sitting in the bathroom and an inmate comes walking out with a handgun going, hey, you forgot your gun in the bathroom. <laughs> and I'm like, like, right oh, I, like I can't right go there. anywhere. I'm tied to the machine. Right. And they all just rushed the guy and took the gun away from him really quick. Oh, okay, okay. So it has been solved. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it could turn very differently. But uh, th that's not a, that's definitely not a normal ex experience. <laughs> right, right. That's uh, especially San Quentin, San Quentin, where we have, um, uh, you know, the prisoners. And, well, now they have their own sentence. unit. They yeah. have their own dialysis unit. But they used to be dialyzed. They used to have to right come here. outside and take them out. To well, go quite to a story. A dialysis unit. Yeah. How but, about other stories? So um, you've been always dialyzing in California. Been traveling. I, went down to uh, Palm Springs several times and dialyzed down there. Um, traveling is a, it's a bit of a trouble. You have to plan way in advance. There's a lot of work that goes into it. You need to talk to your social worker so you can schedule um, to go to uh, a unit. Uh, a friend of mine was, was moving his motorhome down to uh, uh, New, Mexi New Mexico. And I was able to get a dialysis run down in uh, Los Angeles where he was going to stop and see a friend, but I couldn't get a dialysis time in uh, Santa Fe. And so the nurse told me, well, just go to the hospital and tell them you're a dialysis patient and they have to dialyze you. Uh -huh. And I'm thinking, okay, <laughs> what if they say no? <laughs> she goes, no, they have to. So when I got down to Phoenix and I went to the dialysis unit, they said, no, I, I mean, excuse me, uh, Santa Fe, uh, they said, no, we have no um, openings. Um, there's, no, there's no room here. So I went to the emergency room and talked to the emergency doctor, and he gave me the okay, and then all of a sudden I went back to the unit, and I was able to dialyze. But it was a bit unnerving. A bit of trouble. Yeah, unnerving not knowing if I was going to get. I knew uh, the guy who was sitting next to me wanted to go to spring training for the Giants down in Phoenix, and uh, he couldn't get a time, and he had to do the same thing. Oh, wow. He just went down just recently and went down and just walked into the hospital, and they got him a dialysis. Right, and uh, that seems uh, uh, quite inefficient, right? right? On one side for the ER room to. Right. Uh, dealing with this aspects of care right. where they could be managed better through the unit. And um, yeah, it would be nice to hear from other patients who travel <laughs> more. And I recently was traveling to DC mm -hmm. for the conference Kidney X, and I met uh, one patient. He was coming from uh, Slovenia, mm -hmm. and he 
came here to United States and he had to dialyze, he had to schedule his appointments. The business idea was actually planning better for dialysis patients that okay. travels okay. and arranging a proper accommodation, which could be really cool for people who are you know, looking to grow their life and right. grow their experiences to find in ways to dialyze outside of your state if you right. want to travel. So since this is, a, this is the unscripted version, I'll share another funny story. Let's do that. <laughs> um, I was early on dialysis and I was living with my roommate down in San Jose. He had made some video copy tape of Indiana Jones and you could bring videotapes to dialysis and watch the movie. Well, he had taped over another movie and I was watching the movie and when the movie ended, there was a porno movie that started oh. playing on <laughs> the tape in the dialysis unit. Was it just on his TV or old TV? All the patients in the dialysis <laughs> unit had a porno movie on their TVs. A lot of elderly patients there too. Wow. And Stay curious, right? As all, <laughs> it was the funniest thing. All of a sudden the whole unit just got quiet. There was just, there was just like silence. But the funny thing was, is sometimes on dialysis, your blood pressure will low and the alarms will go off. All right. Nobody had low blood pressure during that 15 minutes oh until, until the uh, technician realized. That's a cure. Yeah, That's until, a cure right there. Yeah, until the technician was on the machine. And so they're like, Jeff. I'm like, no, I didn't know it was on there. Jeff. I go, no, it was my roommate. So we're like, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> Sure, it was your roommate. <laughs> High five for that. That's impressive. I think we need to do the contest. It was the coolest dialysis unit story. And uh, you have a good chance as we know that. That was pretty embarrassing and funny at the same time. But I love that no one just really said okay. anything and just okay, enjoyed that I'll, contest. I'll give one more. Okay, it seems you have a lot. I just can keep fishing for some. Um, at the unit I was dialyzing at down in Santa Clara, it, um, they had actually scales under each chair where most units have one scale that you weigh in in beginning and ending, they could measure the weight on every uh, chair during the run. My chair was the only one that didn't have a scale on it. So they had to bring a portable scale for me to weigh, and I check my blood pressure, it's 120 over 80, I get up, I'm talking to the tech, and she's like going along, and I've been up about two minutes, and all of a sudden I said, I'm starting to feel, and I passed out, because mm -hmm. I stood up, and so, Next thing I know, and she was a very beautiful redhead, she's laying on top of me and we're face to face because I passed out and she fell on top of me, guiding me back into the chair. Right. And I wake up and I look at her and I go, was it good for you too? Oh my God. <laughs> you need to have humor, right? With every situation. They go, oh, he's okay. It's Jeff. <laughs>